Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to uh, Stoke Newton History Talk. It's number 16. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm very pleased to discuss the Woodbury Down Estate, which is really a very significant estate historically, uh, an estate which in its heyday was en envisaged as a model for Britain's post war welfare state. So we'll begin with some prehistory, uh, the history of Woodbury Down before the large estate. And you can see a few images here Woodbury Down looking very idyllic and rustic in 1905, and you can see a map which illustrates the extent of development in 1848, a uh, very slight development as you can see along Seven Sisters Road and Woodbury Down itself. The first homes were built in 1820. By the later century, Woodbury Down developed into an area described by some as a home to merchants, bankers and stockbrokers. All this was to change very drastically after 1934. In 1934, Labour took power in the London County Council and was to retain power until 1965. In 1936, the valuer of the London County Council, Frank Hunt, identified an area of some 64 acres to the north and south of the Seven Sisters Road, and it was deemed ideal for large-scale housing development. Close to large public open spaces at Finsbury Park and Clissold Park, served by excellent tram, bus, and underground connections, and very lightly settled. 185 houses occupied by around 1,200 people, of whom only 200 were judged working class. Herbert Morrison for the LCC, who'd been mayor of Hackney in 1920, of course, claimed some, some houses were rotten property, some were in model occupation. But uh, the scheme, the plans, the rouse, large scale opposition. Uh, objectors claiming they would demolish good homes and plant Labour voters in a conservative area. Morrison had allegedly said, quote, we're going to build the Tories out of London. That appears to be an apocryphal remark, but it was one that was taken seriously, certainly by the North London Recorder in November 1938, when under a headline, one million pound slum dwellers paradise, the Recorder stated, Morrison has driven them out of London and find no homes to suit them under the area under his rule. In their place come people who will make Morrison even, even more secure in his county hall office. A public inquiry ensued, and in 1937, a compulsory purchase order was granted. In fact, in 1939, the church commissioners who owned the land uh, sold it uh, freely to the London County Council. Moving on to the next slide, you can see the original plans devised by the London County Council's chief architect, E.P. Wheeler. And these were very uh, innovative and grandiose plans for the time, uh, allegedly influenced by the three examples you can see there, the Quarry Hill Flats in Leeds, Karl Marx Hof in Vienna, built by the radical socialist municipality of Vienna, in the 1920s and early 30s, and in particular, so-called Hufeisen-Siedlow Hufe in Berlin, designed by Bruno Taut, the Horseshoe Estate, for obvious reasons. And Wheeler's plans envisaged around 1,600 homes in two to five-story blocks linked in a horseshoe shape, a population of around 8,000. In the event, those plans were scrapped, and in 1943, J.H. Forshaw, the London County Council submitted a very different scheme based on what were called Zeilenbau principles uh, from the German model. And this was uh, a system, a plan, which uh, contained aligned uh, tall blocks of housing set in parallel, running north-south, in foreshore's words, so that all rooms received the benefit of sunlight at some time during the day. Foreshore planned five to eight storey blocks with the addition of some two-storey houses and maisonettes, around 1,800 dwellings altogether. Uh, the big set piece of the plan was four large eight-storey blocks overlooking the reservoirs. And here they are, as, as uh, constructed, Nicol, Needwood, Ashdale and Burtonwood blocks, the eight-storey blocks. They were then, at the time, the highest in London. Uh, and they had lifts, of course, which was an innovation for the time. Um, but an odd arrangement in which the first five floors only were served by lifts and then staircase access 
higher up. These were originally designed as steel framed brick faced buildings, but eventually, as you can see, they were constructed in monolithic con concrete, uh, allegedly from recycled air raid shelters. Um, people uh, then and subsequently were critical of the design of these eight story blocks. The LCC, however, was pretty proud of the estate, as you can see, it chose to illustrate it in a pamphlet published in 1949. Uh, and of course, the residents were overwhelmingly positive uh, and some wonderful early uh, oral memories of this, uh, which I'll quote briefly. The flat seemed wonderful when we first moved in. I thought mine was marvelous compared to the conditions I was living before. We had a couple of basement rooms and another testimony. Up the stairs we ran, soon found number nine. This is Toxteth House in seven, on Seven Sisters Road. The excitement of opening the front door, our own, finding a nice living room, large bedroom with fitted wardrobe and fitted chest of drawers, smaller bedroom, a bathroom with a green suite, separate toilet, a lovely kitchenette full of cupboards and shining stainless steel sink and draining board. What more could we want? We felt like king and queen. The rest of this date at the time was com completed more conventionally. Uh, the earlier blocks, as you can see on the left, uh, really adopted a pretty traditional, uh, by then, interwar model, five-story walk-up balcony access, tenant blocks, though with the addition of private balconies. The slightly later blocks on the right-hand side, slightly more modern in appearance and completed in yellow stock brick, um, but still that same basic model. In all, around 1,980 homes were, were completed uh, in 57 blocks in this large estate. Now, Woodbury Down, as I said, was, was seen as a model in many ways for the post-war era. And this is seen most uh, powerfully in the community facilities that were provided for the estate. Um, the two big post-war ideas in planning for the neighborhood units, the idea that uh, an estate should contain not just houses and flats, but a range of community facilities, schools, health centers, shops, churches, etc., to, uh, to act in its way as a self-contained community, promoting neighborliness. Uh, and secondly, mixed development. Uh, the idea that um, housing should cater for a range of uh, life stages, not just the family homes, which had overwhelmingly dominated council housing in the interwar period, but homes for childless couples, single people, and elderly people. The estate was seen as a showpiece, the estate of the future, as one newspaper proclaimed in 1953. And one of its uh, centerpieces was the new health centre, uh, originally planned in 1946, approved in 1948. Nye Bevan, Minister of Health and Housing, laid the foundation stone in 1949, and it was completed finally in 1952. And it was intended to be a real model. It was the first of London's health centers and the first approved by the Ministry of Health. And it contained a range of facilities which are beautifully illustrated, probably quite a little bit hard to see, but the TUC poster gives you some indication of what those facilities contained. Separate consulting and waiting rooms for six doctors, minor operations units, rooms for specialists, a sterilizing room, a doctor's laboratory, an x-ray department, general medical and dental examination facilities as well, as well as a creche and nursery. So a really impressive range of facilities intended to cater for a wide variety of health and well-being needs. And there's the uh, Woodbury Dad Health Centre named the John Scott Health Centre after a borough medical, medical officer of health uh, in the present day, still standing proud. Uh, in fact, however, uh, it was uh, pretty unique of its type. The model uh, was unpopular with uh, general practitioners and doctors uh, and really abandoned, abandoned by the Conservative government after 1951. So the Woodbury Down Health Centre intended as an exemplar really never quite fulfilled that role. The other very pioneering and innovative aspects of the Woodbury Down Estate 
was the comprehensive school, the Woodbury Down Comprehensive School, opened in 1955, and you can see it illustrated in its early years. First co educational comprehensive school erected by the London County Council. Uh, and it was headed by a pioneering head teacher, Mrs. Harriet Reynolds Chetwin, and she outlined her vision for the school and its pupils when she said, we would like people to know that this will be one complete school. Pupils will not be called grammar, central, secondary modern, but will all belong to one school with the same choices. Between 1960 and 1966, 80% of 50 year olds continued into the sixth form and half of the school leavers went on to further or higher educational. This was a pretty revolutionary achievement for its age, a genuine comprehensive school in, in, in all that it did. Um, sadly, perhaps uh, the, the school closed in 1981 when it was amalgamated with two local, school, two local schools, but um, that was a model that was uh, tried and tested and widely adopted across the country. Turning to the community and the residents, um, by 1953, there were around 6,500 people living on the estate in around 1,800 homes. There was, according to uh, a, a local history, the Woodbury Down memories, very much a North London estate, with tenants drawn from the oldest minorities who had come to the capital, descendants of Huguenots, Jews from Eastern Central Europe, people from the British colonies, Italy, Ireland, and from boroughs right across North London. Now, the first residents felt, very felt themselves very much chosen people, vetted for need and for ability to pay. Rents in the early years ranged from 14 shillings and sixpence, around 72 and a half pence, for a one bedroom flat, to 51 shillings and ten pence, two pounds 59, for a centrally heated five room flat uh, in one of the big other lots. Rents were collected weekly by the council rent collector. So this was Woodbury Down in its heyday. Um, but by the 1980s, um, residents were complaining of neglect. Uh, they were complaining in particular about the loss of caretakers and rent collectors. They kept an eye on things, saw the estate was tidy, and got, young, got jobs done quickly. Now it allegedly took months to get something fixed. By the 1990s, the state was physically run down and its population was poorer. Uh, also, of course, because of right to buy, uh, around a third of the properties were owned by leaseholders. So really the community had changed quite significantly by that time as well as the physical environment. Now in 2002, the Hackney Council carried out a structural evaluation of the estate and they estimated that 31 of the 57 blocks were beyond economic repair. Regeneration loomed. And of course, in the modern era, regeneration takes a very particular form. Um, it's based on so called public private partnership, it's a model of cross subsidy where, whereby uh, private development and homes for sale subsidise public sector renovation and improvements. In 2006, Hackney Council agreed a contract with Barclay Homes. Uh, Barclay Homes in the nature of these things, was guaranteed a 20% profit margin. In 2008, Barclays obtained Actline planning permission for a master plan of the re redevelopment of the estate. It included a community centre, a new secondary school, youth centre, business centre, new shops, and some new open space. Um, the issue, of course, was in terms of the housing redevelopment, uh, 4,004. 4,664 new homes were planned, and of these, 59% were to be homes for sale. For just 41% of the estate in new would be down would be social housing, 31% social rented, and around 10% shared ownership. This was the vision of the future and the new reality for council estate regeneration. In the way of things, uh, Barclay Homes plans modified and grew more expansive uh, as, as time developed. Um, so Barclay Homes that began, uh, subsequently promoted a 31-storey block, uh, increased density for the private units, 
uh, as well as a gym and swimming pool, the exclusive use for private residents. This is a very different vision of the estate. Uh, this kind of modification and this threat prompted the formation by existing residents of the Woodbury Down Community Organisation, which then became a very active campaigning force uh, on the estate and in the process. Um, the Woodbury Down Community Organisation secured a new master plan that accepted the increased density. Um, it uh, retained the uh, percentage of affordable 41% affordable housing, social housing, um, and it achieved, it hoped, commitments to a fairer share of good views, a more mixing of different tenures, and to maintaining that level of, of open space provision. That said, it's of course a very highly controversial process, but most of the social rented housing built to date is located on less favourable sites, whereas the homes for sale are located in prime positions overlooking the reservoir and the new park. This of course remains a controversial and contested process, ongoing as final completion isn't scheduled until 2032. You can see uh, the estate in 2013 uh, as that process was beginning. And here it is, the, the new Woodbury Down and some of those showpiece private estates. To its critics, this has been state-led gentrification. To its defenders, and Hackney Council will make this point powerfully, it has been quite strong uh, and uh, reasonably effective consultation with existing residents uh, and the proportion of social rented housing is uh, in numerical terms at least uh, similar to that which existed on the older state the number of council housing uh, units basically so you will have your own view of this um, I, I understand uh, very much the, the, the critics and I, I, I regret the fact that uh, regeneration is uh, under the present kind of financial regime and rules conducted in this form. Um, but it's been uh, certainly a, a process of, of gain and loss overall, and you can form your own judgment. It's an interesting, uh, very recently published academic paper on the Green Down, just published this year in the International Journal of Housing Policy. And I'll quote from that. Uh, the academics Nelson and Lewis, and they, their overall conclusion was as follows. It illustrates how private sector, sector developers put forward to afford the interests of existing residents. Nonetheless, it provides an example of how a residence organisation can, through engaging in partnership, win some significant concessions. It has highlighted the importance of independent organisations challenging stigmatisation and support from independent advisors to effective resistance. And my own conclusion is as follows. Once our dreams were collective, and if the former would be down a state never quite lived up to the hype, it represented at least an earnest and shared ambition to build high quality housing and real community for ordinary people. Will the new estate do that? 